Testing one, two. There we go. Okay. Well, uh, welcome back, everybody. Uh, uh, hopefully, you all are refreshed and snacked and, and ready for the, the final push. Uh, um, uh, I'm Brian Bellendorf. I'll be your MC for this uh, kind of closing session. We'll have some closing comments from Crobe later. Um, I, I, we're going to uh, do this in two parts. The first is I'm going to have a fireside chat uh, with Jamie Thomas here from IBM. Uh, and then after that, we'll have a panel with a, a set of really great guests. But I certainly encourage all of you who are sitting out in the bleachers uh, and the far off <laughs> kind of corners, feel free to come in closer. Uh, we don't bite. Uh, uh, and, and being closer in, we don't have a, a stuff to present or anything like that. Uh, uh, feel free to come in and, and, and make it feel like we're uh, talking to a nice full room. Uh, thank you all for sticking it out. Um, so it is my pleasure to uh, I introduce to you Jamie Thomas. Uh, Jamie is the chair, uh, chair of the OpenSSF Governing Board. She also oversees all of enterprise security for IBM. Uh, and uh, she has been a part of this project since we pressed the reboot button in uh, October, uh, September, sorry, uh, uh, and uh, got things underway. And I thought it'd be really fun to help the audience get to know more um, both about you and, and kind of the, your work at IBM and kind of the interests that uh, led you to this point. Uh, and, and frankly, what you know, the, the, the corporate world, so to speak, thinks about what we're doing and what we should be doing sure. as we go through this. So um, thank you for being here. I'm glad to be here. Great. Um, so uh, let's start by getting to know you better. Uh, could you share more about kind of your journey inside IBM to the role that you have, or tell us more about the role uh, and kind of what led you to, to this moment in time? Yeah, sure. And one of my uh, favorite topics, of course, is women in STEM, which we all know there's not enough of. So mm -hmm. thanks to all of you that are here. But um, I try to encourage ladies that there's a lot of opportunity in this field, and it's really fascinating. But I, I joined as a computer science programmer uh, in IBM before we had a really, we were just starting our software business and ended up being a $20, a $20 billion business in the end. Uh, you know, it's kinda, it grew a little bit. And along the way, I, um, I worked on application development projects, was part of the Eclipse decision to donate the original software to the Eclipse Foundation and start the Eclipse Foundation. Um, did a lot of work with our support of Linux in the early days when we decided fundamentally that we would embrace Linux, that we would support Linux as a key operating system. Um, and obviously, those were the days where we were also embracing uh, Java quite a bit. So Java is a key uh, middleware component, if you will, for our middleware business. And I spent most of my career in software. And then somehow I got asked to go by our current CEO now. He's the CEO of IBM to go to the hardware division and stimulate software in hardware. Of course, you know, hardware does not run without software last time we checked. And we were working on OpenStack technologies, Linux again, a lot of the software-defined technologies. And through that uh, path, I end up, ended up owning, which is what I own today, in, in addition to enterprise security, all of the IBM processor development and the systems development that support our high-end systems, uh, Z, power, and quantum computing systems, in addition to my, my night job as enterprise security, if things were not exciting enough. But those topics all kind of fit together, if you think about it. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I mean, uh, certainly quantum and, and, and AI and, 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 and even processors, like, like uh, there are security ramifications through, throughout all of that. Yeah. Um, what would you say, though, is kind of different about cybersecurity in 2022, like compared to, to five years ago, 10 years ago, uh, and especially kind of in the domain that, that we're focused in? Well, I, I would say, first of all, and when you know, my journey to get into enterprise security was really through the lens of product security, whether that was software product security, or hardware product security, if any of you are here from hardware background, Spectre Meltdown was pretty exciting. Yeah. Um, and that was uh, also the precursor to you know, the software supply chain attacks like solar winds and things like that. And I think what's different now is that uh, you do have to have, for an enterprise like IBM, you do have to have an effective melding of cyber operations with product security. I mean, they go hand in hand given the role that we play. Uh, they're both very important. And the level of sophistication of these software supply chain ta attacks, I think, was eye-opening. Um, I'm sure that many of you all here, and first of all, thanks for being here and devoting yourselves to software security, because without you, we're not going to make a difference. Uh, but SolarWinds was fairly interesting from a number of dimensions, right? We've studied it. Um, you know, we, we took it apart. We've got a PhD in SolarWinds. And I would say that we 
took away a lot of learnings from that that we started to implement even before Log4j hit. And Log4j uh, was just more prevalent, right? Because it was a very prevalently used component and therefore it affected, um, not only was it a cyber attack, right? Because for any of those of you that do cyber operations, you can see at some point early on, we had instrumented like day one, our tools to detect Log4j attacks and we could see exactly how many we were getting every day and from where they were coming, literally, you know, which country of origin, that kind of thing. Um, but these were very different attacks and, and of course log, Log4j was very prevalent in the software stack. Uh, and so patching that much software in a reasonable amount of time and meeting the expectations of all the customers, fairly challenging. So I think that then became a catalyst for all of us though in the industry to say, how do we be more proactive about this? How do we help open source uh, prevent these kind of things in the future, but more importantly, be prepared uh, should they happen again in the future, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, Log4j, I don't know about you all, but it took up a little bit of our holiday season, as did SolarWinds the previous year. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and what about um, uh, the, the degree of interest that we're seeing from government in, <laughs> uh, in cybersecurity topics these days and, and, and open source cybersecurity? Is this, is this new and different or have they oh, kind yes, of always yes. been well, we, uh, Thanks for bringing that up. Okay, of course, sure. it's, it is new. I mean, the government's always been interested, but I would say the level of interest, of course, was heightened because uh, as we, as, as, I, I think it really started to, to heighten with solar winds and then Lung4j was like the icing on the cake, right? And what it said is that we as an industry need to cooperate more fully to conquer this challenge. Without that cross-industry collaboration, we weren't going to make as much progress, and that included cooperation with the government as well. And so I think that's been the, 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 the beauty of OpenSSF, is we now have this industry collaborate, collaborative for technology organizations as well as commercial organizations. We have a lot of financial firms that are also involved in the community and I think that's gonna allow us to, to work with the government. And of course, we had the two meetings that you highlighted earlier in the presentation. Uh, we've come out of those meetings, I think, with some very concrete actions that we can take. We also can see that other, or other countries around the world will also want to do similar things. And we, we and IBM are being asked to participate on other government uh, boards of a similar nature in other countries. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, in, so in 2009, when I worked at the, the White House in the Office of Science and Tech Policy, I don't think there was anybody else in the executive branch, either appointee or career, who had been a developer or who had, you know, uh, engaged with the open source community previously. And to them, mm -hmm. uh, software was like something other people did, right? Something that the, the private mm -hmm. sector did. You write an RFP and then you get mm -hmm. responses. And there was kind of an arm's length, kind of almost willful ignorance about, about software in general, but open source in particular. Um, uh, now, in 2022, that seems very different. I mean, we have people like Alan, uh, uh, who's, Alan you know, uh, uh, <laughs> is one of many people that I've met in the last year. Um, uh, who kind of show the, demonstrate the difference in this. Um, right. uh, just before our meeting as well on the 12th, on the 11th I testified to this House panel, uh, the House, House Committee on Science uh, and Technology who, were, who are also looking into this. It's not just the, the White House and executive branch. And to find that there were Congress people who were um, themselves uh, programmers or recent, uh, you know, who knew, had like operational experience with AI programming and the like was pretty refreshing. And you could tell because their follow-up questions yes. were knowledgeable. It wasn't just that they were well prepped by their staff. It was, uh, although one was still surprised when I mentioned I'd rather use open source code that uh, had had bugs discovered in it uh, and fixed, of course, right? Because uh, it was, I think it was uh, uh, Congressman Perlmutter who said, you'd rather use software that had bugs in it? And I was like, bugs that had been found and fixed, that, that means people cared about it, right? That, that means, means there's there's actively, contributors, right? Yeah, there's contributors, but there's also mm -hmm. people scrutinizing it. So no, I um, think it's it great like that there's been this dialogue, right? And understanding yeah. and a lot of really solid collaboration from the National Security Council, CISA, the NIST uh, folks that have been in the meetings. I think that as a community, we all have our different points of view. Uh, IBM's a little bit unique in that we have lived for 111 years in the technology industry, which is hard to do. And so we have a lot of legacy out there, which others may not have, uh, that uh, gives us a different point of view from that aspect. But there's a number of technology companies and they bring their strengths, their skills, their point of view to the table, likewise the commercial clients. 
And I think that's what makes it unique. It's been a unique uh, dialogue. Yeah. Well, I think also we've progressed from open source being seen as like the thing to build websites with yeah. and do this kind of almost, I don't say frivolous, but, but something that was optional perhaps until recently, right? And now is really about critical infrastructure. If it's about the software running in grids and power stations and the like. Absolutely, uh, open source yeah. is uh, more than critical. Uh, I think we've all taken, we've all made it uh, critical. So, and the folks in this room have made it uh, successful, made it critical, and uh, we're all dependent on it. So given how critical it is yeah. now, and given uh, uh, yeah. David's presentation on uh, cybersecurity education, I mean, this is something that, that you see as a very, very serious thing worthy of investment. Uh, do you mind talking some more about that? Well, I, absolutely. So we believe, and just this morning I got a report. Every day I get a multi-page cybersecurity report in terms of just what happened in the last week. Um, uh, and that's along with regular cyber reports of the day and, of course, the Sadly, uh, the Russia report <laughs> that I get. Uh, but, you know, 750,000 open cyber jobs in, in the United States, cybersecurity jobs. So how are we ever going to start to meet the need of that if we don't really expand the aperture of education? So IBM um, has done a number of things to reach out to, to different communities, right? That includes the historically black colleges and universities. We've selected 20 and we've announced six so far that we're creating specialized portals for, for cyber education. And we'd really like to partner with the Linux Foundation for some of the education that David spoke about, right? It's really exciting. How do we get that into that community, uh, into that university and college sector? So uh, the one that I like the most, of course, because I'm from North Carolina, is North Carolina A&T. Um, but there's a Southern University, um, uh, Xavier out of uh, Louisiana, uh, Morgan State, uh, Clark Atlanta University, a number of others that are participating, and I think this is important. We also have a program to reach veterans. There's 250,000 uh, individuals that re you know come out of the armed forces, so how do we work with Veterans Affairs to reach that community, and then how do we reach those with neurodiversity? All of us have uh, relatives or friends that have neurodiversity challenges, dyslexia, um, uh, perhaps autism and other things, very important to expand. And I've got members on my team that are neurodiversity, folks that are executives and have done amazing things. So I, I really feel excited about that. And so I, I think we have to expand the reach. I have so many organizations that come to IBM and they say, we can't hire a single person. We cannot afford to hire anyone with security skills. So we don't even know where to go. We don't even know where to start. There's an opportunity for all of us to create those skills and to leverage the education you all are doing. In fact, uh, we saw your announcement already today. We want to leverage that education for IBM Internal to um, complement our cyber training. So we track cyber training to the death. Uh, we are trying to make sure that people don't do those silly things that David talked about. Uh, that's why you have automated tools, uh, cyber tools that detect the crazy behavior that does happen every day. Uh, because you can't train everybody, but you try to, right? Um, but along with that, this developer training, I think, is going to be really important for, for going forward. The other thing we really feel is that contribution to open source is something we have to do. We have over 5,000 contributors between what IBM has and what Red Hat has, because Red Hat is an IBM company, albeit they're separate. Uh, and we also believe that Log4j, we went back and we looked at our most utilized open source projects. And we did a, an assessment of contributors on those projects. And we realized we had to contribute to the most utilized projects as well as to the cool projects, the new projects that everybody flocks to, right? And so we are balancing our contribution and we're re rewarding people who go and contribute to those projects with monetary uh, recognition. That's great. That's great. So uh, you're chair of the OpenSSF Governing Board. And for those of you who don't know how the kind of typical Linux Foundation governance model work uh, works, um, obviously all the uh, uh, actual substance of what we do is built in the public, built voluntarily, uh, built. Sometimes we're able to provide some seed funding for things here to help get them started. But really, we want the application of things happening publicly and being driven bottoms up organically based on you know the, the phrase um, from the West Wing uh, television show, history is made by those who show up. As has always been like one of my guidance uh, guiding lights, but um, uh, but what the governing board does is oversee a budget, 
right? We're able to raise uh, some funds. We're now at uh, enough membership to be able to afford some staff, be able to make some investments and things. Uh, and it's through that kind of oversight on the budget and us as staff, you know, you could tell us we're not doing a good job and, and swap us out, that you, you know, have some influence over the strategy and direction for the overall community. But it's really to help support the okay. community. Um, and we have on our governing board, um, I don't want to say, well, I, it's not every large company, but it's, it's like it's a lot of the large companies that matter in the, the software, the developer tools space, uh, increasingly financial services firms and the like. Um, it's a, it, it, as, the, as, as your servant, I, I work for you, right? Um, I, 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 I have opinions that I might hold to myself, but it sometimes feels like uh, uh, helping uh, that group come to an agreement uh, can be a challenge, right? Or, or come, uh, look at kind of common direction. So as chair, um, what are some, uh, some thoughts that you have on, on uh, bringing that community to, around a common vision uh, and, uh, and working together towards supporting the community? Well, I think whenever you have a group of stakeholders like that, it will be impossible to agree on everything, right? Um, but what I have seen is relative agreement on these top priority items. I thought the meeting that we had in D.C. helped me understand why some of them were more important to others than they were to me. So I took away that level of understanding. Well, I might not care about this, but others in the room did, right? And uh, I think what we're doing is participating in those that we think we can have the most impact to. And frankly, it's like every other large firm. There's a lot of things that are pulling on people's time. So Jeff Boric, who's here from my team, uh, I actually meet with the team since SolarWinds. I meet every week with the team on software supply chain actions. <laughs> because for a company as large as we are, there's something to talk about every week. And the importance to us is making sure we've got participation in these work groups and we're really being, we're, we're really at the table that we're gonna help the work group and we're gonna help ourselves, right? Because that, that's how we get the execution done. And I would say before this new governing body, we probably were, you know, we, we were perhaps not as at the table as much as we needed to be. We also, of course, collaborate with Red Hat who are very involved in Six Door and things like that to make sure we're divide and conquer as it makes appropriate, right? Um, makes sense. But I think that uh, that's the value that we can get together as this community. Um, we, you've talked in this meeting about a lot of the important actions, right? Which is the automation of best practices for the open source projects to make sure the developers can take advantage and be responsible for security, but also have productivity. Because uh, we, we keenly recognize the productivity that open source has brought to the world. But how do we do that and we still have security? Uh, the only good thing that came out of Log4j is an enormous amount of awareness of how important security is to everybody. Uh, my team that, that does cybersecurity, they believe that fundamentally until there's a big incident, you, you just don't get enough attention. So they believe that Log4J was the calling card, right? That said, we have to do something dramatically different as a community. And uh, I think it's been, a, it's been a catalyst, perhaps an unfortunate catalyst, but a catalyst. And I think we can uh, go from there and take advantage of that, uh, the situation and improve things going forward. It's, it's gonna be so important to us because um, the world runs on software, uh, it's uh, sometimes obscure what software you're running underneath the hood. Uh, I agree that the end clients should not have to worry about that. Uh, those of us that provide the software to them and support it, you know, it's our obligation to take the burden of security and making sure that the software is designed with security in mind. And you can do different things. You can implement the things we've talked about. You can consume open source. Uh, that you know has been managed well and curated, uh, and you, obviously you can implement things in your product lines that, in, that uh, support secure, mm -hmm. security. Well, one, one thing that's been really heartening for me to see has been the participation from the financial services yes. industry in OpenSSF, uh, not just showing up and joining as a member, but also making code contributions and participating strategically. We'll talk a little bit about this on the next panel. 
Um, but uh, <coughs> what are some other industries? This is kind of a wild card, sorry, I didn't like prep you on this. What are some other industries? And I'll, t I'll, I'll give you the two on my mind after, after I hear yours, but um, uh, are there other industries that you think might be next in line as, as kind of end user industries, as folks who should be paying attention to these issues, potentially having their staffs get involved and in, in, in following what we're doing and perhaps even contributing? Well, clearly, uh, I'm really glad that the financial services teams are engaged because during Log4J, I think I spent five hours a day talking with financial services services organizations, right. um, literally. It was uh, because regulated industries are typically the most uh, concerned about these things. But that's a statement in and of itself. Why do you have to be regulated to necessarily be worried about this? But next, I would say on the list was, was healthcare. Okay. So healthcare organizations, through my lens, uh, the most affected organizations around the world typically are, are hospitals for ransomware. And you saw this a lot during COVID-19 where a lot of healthcare organizations were being attacked, right? So healthcare, insurers of healthcare, another big important area for us and then the area that is most of a target uh, that needs to step up to the plate probably more fully are those that are running embedded systems, uh, whether those are uh, in manufacturing uh, or uh, critical infrastructure like our grids and things like that. And that's where you have to take extra precautions because I own manufacturing because I own hardware. And so what you find in manufacturing environments are these hardened devices that have very old software in them. And when you have a case like that, when it's inside this $200,000, whatever it is, right, you have to take different steps and protocols to make sure you can protect yourself until that is upgraded, right? Uh, you're not going to just throw out equipment of that value um, tomorrow, but it is really critical, I think, that those, that, that those organizations step up to the plate, right? Yeah, consumer electronics, embedded industrial, yeah. uh, all those makes a ton of sense. The only other industry in my mind was um, the insurance industry. Because yeah. all those companies that write it in cybersecurity breach insurance policies, you know, uh, uh, getting them to nudge their, their clients to use more secure alternatives and the like uh, could be a way to help encourage investment in the right kinds well, of things. Well, certainly they started to increase the premiums, right? Because <laughs> I think it was the uh, pipeline, uh, the, with the colonial pipeline um, mm. situation. And I'm in North Carolina, and all I can say is my cyber team sent me a note that day. Pipelines have been attacked. We all went out and got gasoline. Now... <laughs> People said, well, you're part of the problem. You went and got gas when you didn't need it. I said, well, I was here for the last hurricane that shut down that pipeline, and I sat in line for seven hours. I don't have the time to do that right now. So this pipeline is going to be down, down for seven days, and I've got, my, I've got my gas, and I made my choice. But it, that's how long it was down, right, because that's the average length of time that those typically take. But that's an example of a, you know, one of those situations, right, that was very critical. My last question will be, um, what are, or do you think is the most important thing for us as a community to, to figure out how to do by the end of this year, uh, uh, just to get accomplished, even if it's a, something we haven't yet talked about, even if it's kind of a wild card, uh, uh, just like one important thing for us to get out there and succeed at doing? Well, I don't know if it's going to, I don't know if we could say that one thing is going to, to make or break the year, but... Certainly uh, making a lot of headway in the education aspect because we're not going to do this without thousands of developers who feel, feel that they're being recognized and that security is important and that it's fun to be a part of security, right? I actually, in a strange way, have a lot of fun with cyber attacks. <laughs> I mean, that probably is, says something, you know, odd. <laughs> but you learn a lot from these things, right? And I think that's really imperative that we marshal the army of thousands of contributors that can make a difference, and then that, that army will help us do many of the other things that we've been speaking about today. Well, my dad was a COBOL programmer at <laughs> IBM when I was growing up, and he would take me into the computer lab in the basement in Glendale's office, and he would give me a green screen, a terminal to it. I, I don't know what he was thinking, because I knew how to write BASIC, and there was this one address I could poke and cause him to have to come out of his office and press reboot buttons on the mainframe. So uh, I understand that... Reboots uh, aren't good on the mainframe. That's no, not a good no, they're thing. not. Um, <laughs> uh, so I understand that why, why this kind of vulnerability thing and, and uh, uh, cyber attacks thing could be a little bit interesting. It certainly was to eight-year-old me. So um, <clears throat> thank you very much, Jamie. This was a really enlightening talk. Uh, thank you. And thanks uh, again to all of you that are here and taking your time for this important topic. Thanks. And thanks, Great. Brian, for everything you're doing. Great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> I can never tell if he's doing this or this.